Thank you. Some people over here couldn't quite hear that. So. Oh, sorry. Okay. Again, we are doing the event on Saturday, September 18th. It is out at the Ozone in Lakewood, and we are focusing on uh, we are focusing on all the things necessary to create a safe and sane and epic experience. Safe and sane epic experience. Ozone, September 18th. September 18th. Saturday, September 18th. Saturday, September 18th. Am I doing this right? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Now we have an announcement from Bree. met um, and uh, I'm on the board of NOAC and we are planning a psychedelic education festival so this is an event that we are really really excited about um, I think this is probably our first time formally actually announcing it so um, what we're envisioning is a psychedelic education festival that's going to take place in downtown Denver on 16th Street Mall and we're inviting all of the organizations who are working with psychedelics and research and policy and just advocacy work. Um, a number of organizations have already offered support and will be present. Um, Fireside Project, Psychedelics Today, Naropa, um, Maya Health, for those of you who are familiar with any of those organizations. Um, we have another, a, a bunch of others who are gonna be joining us as well. So. We're really, really excited about this event. Uh, we're also having some live DJs, food trucks, live painters. Um, it's tentatively scheduled for October 9th, and it's uh, at the outer space um, area on 16th Street Mall. So it's like outer, is that outer space? Like, anyway, I'm really excited about that when we found the venue. Um, so we hope that you'll join us. We'll definitely be sending out more information as it becomes available. Um, but we hope to see you all there. And if any of you have any questions about it or just want to come up and say hi and introduce yourselves, um, I'm sitting over there. Please feel free to come up and say hi. So, thanks. All right, okay. I had to write down all my notes here, so that's what's happening. Um, okay, so also the most important part, please do not try to obtain or sell substances here. That's not what we're doing here. We're really trying to like not do that. It's happened like where people have asked publicly to get illegal drugs. Like please just don't do it because it just makes us look bad. It makes you look bad. And we really like being here and we don't want to get in trouble because like we really believe in what we're doing around like educating and like community and all these wonderful things. So don't mess it up for us. Thank you. Okay, now um, I want to introduce Shannon, Dr. Shannon Hughes. You guys probably know her if you've been to one of our events. Um, Shannon is a professor over at CSU, and she's going to be talking about a case against medicalization. And if you guys know Shannon, you know that her whole life is basically dedicated to advocacy and educating. And yeah, I'm so excited to like witness you. <laughs> it's going to be really good. So, um, it's good to be a witness. Thank you. Lots of notes. Um, yeah, welcome, everybody. For everybody who raised their hands that you are new, this is your first time, welcome. It's a beautiful, wonderful, supportive, great community to be a part of. I didn't know what community was until I came into community. Uh, with Lilo and Bree and Ra like all the people that were doing this together and some uh, homies back there and uh, lots of people in this room actually um, on different sort of degrees of closeness but it's all community and it's really good and um, it's healing also so that's part of this work um, getting out of our little isolated worlds and being in community and doing more together than we can on our own and um, yeah sharing knowledge and resources and all of the things so thanks for having me here to speak. I don't speak a lot. I, I introduce a lot of people, but I don't speak a lot. So this is like a different, a little twist on things. Um, but tonight I wanted to um, kind of make a case, as it says here. It's not the case, 
against medicalization is a case. This is a string of thoughts. Um, I live in this world of ideas, which is quite a privilege um, that comes with being in an academic setting. You get to think about things and play around with ideas and um, challenge the status quo and whatever. And so these are just some like loose ideas that I've sort of play around with that lead me personally to an advocacy position of decrim first and actually sort of against personally medicalization as a drug policy reform pathway. And so I just want to share these thoughts and they're not all fully formed. They're not all, there's like each one I feel like could be its own rabbit hole. We could, we should create just a semester long course on this topic basically so that we can follow all the little threads and we're not gonna be able to do that tonight. Um, but I'm gonna just present some thoughts. Um, can you go to, oh I can't control the slides so I'm gonna have to like say something. Next slide, please. Um, just to say that nothing is original. Like, I don't have any original thoughts. Um, <laughs> this is so low, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> but it's heavily borrowed, uh, so I just want to give credit to where these ideas are borrowed from, especially this guy up here, David, who is my mentor in the PhD program. He's at UCLA now. He's brilliant, and he gave this talk years ago that still inspires me to this day. This was in 2005 he gave this talk and I read it still and I'm blown away by it. I'm like, dude, you're brilliant. Like, this is so good. And so a lot of this is actually borrowed from him. Um, go ahead, next slide please. So, here we go. So we've got these sort of major threads of um, arguments for access to psychedelics and to other drugs. I'm gonna kind of talk about these middle two, the therapeutic use and uh, a rights-based approach. So therapeutic use um, is a perspective that if there is a recognized medical or therapeutic benefit, like what we're seeing with MDMA or PTSD, psilocybin mushrooms for depression, um, that we should grant access to doctors and healthcare professionals um, for specific people to access that drug for specific purposes. Um, as long as there's like a therapeutic indication. So therapeutic use sort of leads us to medicalization as a sort of policy or regulatory framework. So we're gonna talk about that for a minute and then that'll lead us into a little bit of like this human rights approach as like in contrast to and how a human's rights lens sort of maybe challenges um, uh, some of the founding assumptions that would lead us into medicalization. Okay, that was perfectly clear, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to, uh, one, provide some critiques of medicalization and, and starting with a, just touching on some historical context. I feel like the first, like, the first, the first step to take when you're trying to grapple with any issue is to adopt a little bit of a historical perspective. And so we're going to bring a little bit of, like, historical social context to medicalization as this larger sort of social, sociological construct. I'm not trying to sound as heady as that just came out as it's not, it's really not. Um, but uh, just a little bit of historical context and then we're gonna challenge some of the basic assumptions that underlie um, basically prescription privileges. That's what we're essentially questioning here. So uh, I don't know how things are gonna land, if this is gonna seem provocative or anything. I don't know how it's gonna land with people, but I do wanna say that um, I think it's just like, our duty to be critical and ask good questions and challenge assumptions and rock the boat a little bit and not take for granted that the social arrangements that we have as they exist are necessarily like the way things have to exist. And so if we have an opportunity to think a little more innovatively and forward, like forward, really be forward thinking and create what's next in terms of drug policy reform, that we should use that opportunity as a community. So, um, just because I critique a profession, maybe the profession of psychiatry, maybe the profession of social work, which is where I come from, does not mean that I don't like psychiatrists or anti-psychiatry or anti-doctor or anti-Western medicine. It's just a critical lens. Ask my partner, I'm terrible to live with, I'm critical. I, I will pick apart anything that you put in front of me. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that psychiatrists are terrible people or anything like that. So please don't take it as like I'm disparaging any individuals within a profession. That's not the case. Okay, those are all the caveats. Let's start. Next slide. 
So just a little context, like I said, I'm gonna start with a little history. Um, there's a lot of history behind all of this, and it's all interesting. But basically, medicalization, what are we even talking about? Because we talk about it in like sort of this drug policy, you know, we're gonna med medicalize cannabis or medicalize whatever. Um, so really, we're saying, we're gonna make medical, we're gonna make something medical. We're gonna make it a medical problem, a medical condition, requiring medical expertise, um, requiring medical solutions. Um, and we kind of have a tendency to do this. We have a history of doing this in our sort of white Western um, tradition over the last, I don't know, 100 years or something like that. We've sort of expanded medical jurisdiction over different aspects of our lives and behaviors and conditions and phenomena. Um, and I just would note here that just because something has a biological basis doesn't ipso facto make it a medical issue or a medical condition. So, you know, childbirth or use of drugs, there's biological components, there's biological things happening, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a medical problem requiring medical expertise or, or rightly belongs within like medical jurisdiction. So I just want to kind of like make that little bit of a nuance. Um, but early medical, so we have this trend to sort of medicalize more and more aspects of our lives and behaviors. Next slide please. And in early medicalization, it was this shift from religious, applying a religious or moral framework, like you're sinful, you're immoral for these behaviors, to a medical, giving medical meaning to it, from religious meaning to medical meaning. Um, so you're sick and you're in need of treatment. So it was just like sort of the, sort of the sh cultural shift in how we understood our behaviors and how we labeled ourselves, how we understood the sort of, um, how we get help for things, like where the proper place is that we should be looking to for solutions. Um, and so we've been, sociologists started naming this in the 70s, medicalization. And it was just a trend that's continued. Um, so, you know, drug use, violence, eating disorders, menopause, childbirth, aging, shyness, there's just a whole slew of things that over time you can kind of see that trend toward medicalization. Please continue. And this is one kind of classic example. So my area is like behavioral health at CSU and social work, so I am sort of pulling in that critical psychiatry, behavioral health stuff, and it bridges into psychedelics, it's certainly in terms of advocacy, but these examples aren't like psychedelic specific, sorry about that. Um, so does anybody remember, this was an ad, I think it's kind of cut off here, this was an ad for social anxiety disorder, you might have seen these a lot in the early 2000s. Um, so this is just like an example of medicalization. Um, so Paxil was approved in 96 um, for um, depression, but it was a pretty saturated market already for depression and antidepressants, and so they wanted to get into the GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, the drug manufacturer for Paxil, wanted to get into the anxiety market. Uh, wasn't as saturated at that time. So they, um, yeah, put in the FDA for, for new indications for anxiety-related indications, one of them being social anxiety disorder, which at that time was a fairly obscure diagnosis. It wasn't super common, uh, social anxiety disorder. It was social phobia before that. Um, but so it was approved, uh, FDA approved Paxil for social anxiety disorder in 99, and then we see the big disease awareness campaign after it was approved for social anxiety disorder. So millions of dollars spent on bus, bus ads, you know, on the side of buses, subways, billboards, with the tagline, things like this, imagine being allergic to people. And a series of ads featuring, I'm gonna read this, Paxil's efficacy in helping social anxiety disorder sufferers brave dinner parties and public speaking. That was like, the ads, Paxil will help you bring dinner parties and public speaking. The latter of which public speaking is people's like number one fear, like after, like before even death or something. So you can imagine the market that they were trying to capture here um, through these ads. And so through these media campaigns, um, GSK was able, this was like just so clever. <laughs> it's just so clever. Um, so through these campaigns, GSK was able to um, position um, SAD, social anxiety disorder, as both common. It's like, you know, everybody, like it, both common, which like reduces the stigma of it, and also abnormal, which 
suggest that maybe you should go see your doctor and get treatment. So it's very clever to position it, both common and abnormal. Um, please go ahead. So, oh wait, yeah, yeah, you can see there. I took out a slide at the last minute here. So basically, just wanted to say a little historical context of like, okay, when we're talking about medicalization, there's, there's just like this larger historical and social context of like this trend towards medicalization is something that we should sort of do. We just sort of expand that jurisdiction of medicine. Um, and it's very much fueled by industry interests, which is I think an important part to consider uh, that industry profit interests are a major engine behind medicalization um, and the ways that we've been, been talking about it. Um, okay, so what about drug use? Okay, so an access to drugs. So have, we certainly haven't always lived in this era, of, well, we've, I've always lived in an era of prohibition, but that's not always been the policy framework. Um, so of course, prior to the current era, we had more access to drugs. So here's an ad for coca wine for the fatigue of mind or body. Um, go ahead to the next one, another picture. This is cocaine tooth drops, toothache drops for children. Um, um, and then the next one, <laughs> we have um, in, the, in the 1890s, no, go back one. In the 1890s, um, you could order like a small amount of heroin and like a syringe from the Sears catalog, the Sears Ripup catalog that was sent to like millions of homes. American homes. Um, so there was this era, this was an era of patent medicines where, yes, we had access. We had more access during this era and it wasn't all great. Um, certainly people were harmed, um, but some of that was because there was no way to know for sure what you were consuming. Um, and so that's where most of the harms came from is like these elixirs and cure-alls were sold and you could buy them openly go to your Sears catalog, but there was no way to know, you know, there were, wasn't like truth and labeling or anything. So you go to the next slide. So the, in this era, that's when we see the Pure Food, and, Pure Food and Drug Act, which created what we know today as the FDA. But it was principally a labeling law so that any drug maker um, had to um, identify the presence and the quantity of certain ingredients like morphine, opium, um, chloral hydrate, um, alcohol, if you had any of those certain ingredients, you had to like identify the presence and the amount and whatever you were selling. Um, and you could not make misleading statements about the drug's ingredients. Okay, so over time this expanded. So first, some of the like regulation around our access to drugs started with just like truth and labeling. We need to know what's in here because people are like getting really sick. Um, and then over time, it's it's kind of like a reaction. There's there was like two, at least two big disasters, but like one was in the 1930s, um, where like 100 plus people died from some elixir that contained a poisonous solvent, and you have a big reaction, which is kind of what happens, right? Like something disastrous happens, and then there's like this big, heavy-handed sort of like reaction. Um, and so, and, and not that these are all like bad, like checks for like drug safety, like I'm not saying that. This is just, just kind of tracing some events that happened. Um, but so at that time, then they required drug makers had to prove that your drug was safe. And that, that was in the 1930s. And then in the 1960s, you had the thalidomide disaster. If anybody familiar with thalidomide, they caused birth defects, it was a sedative given to a lot of pregnant women um, at that time, and terrible birth defects. Um, and so at that then, there was like the, the backlash to expand drug makers to, um, they had to prove that their drugs were effective for the advertised conditions. So it's a slow sort of like, you know, movement into more and more sort of regulation. But this was this next slide is actually what I think is the really important piece of legislation that is often overlooked. So 1951, I should have asked before I went to the slide, how many people know um, <laughs> this amendment, 1950, 1951, that basically created prescription privileges. Um, and so it created a class of drugs that were only available by prescription and then over the counter drugs. And so basically saying that there's some drugs that are just too dangerous and so you're gonna need to go to your doctor, you need to get a prescription. And so this is the a law, the legislation that, that granted prescription rights to medical doctors. 1951, that's not that long ago. So it kind of seems like, I don't know, 
whenever I bring this up to my students about like abolishing prescription privileges, they're like, what? How could we possibly? It's like unfathomable. <laughs> what would a world look like? I'm like, 1951, people. <laughs> Not that long ago. <laughs> we've, we've learned some things, like we can revise and adjust and like and, and maybe pivot a little bit if we need to. Um, so go on. So after that, now, uh, yeah, directly available by prescription. After that, um, you know, this is just an ad for Milltown. I just threw it in for fun, really. Uh, for the anxious housewife or Hollywood star uh, of the 1950s. Um, but you, it, so you start to see advertisements, and the advertisements certainly. I'm sure we're all familiar with advertisements now. Direct to consumer ads for prescription drugs. We're one of the only countries in the world that allows that. But um, basically, it's a narrative of like, oh, here's some ailment, some suffering, some condition, um, and here's some language to understand it, some sort of label or diagnosis or disorder or whatever. And maybe you should go talk to your doctor about this this drug. Um, so. Um, yeah, so instead of buying the drugs that we want directly for the effects that we desire, we're sort of being told, we're sort of starting to shape through advertisements a way of understanding the nature of our distress and then being pointed to the prescriber as the sort of authority and gatekeeper for us to get a drug that we want. And as we all know, in some cases, it's kind of a farce, that interaction, right? Sometimes we know the drug that we want and we're like, right, what do I have to say? <laughs> to get this drug that I would want. <laughs> it's not always that way, but we know that that happens. Um, so highlighting this, I highlight all of this because just to say that the pharmaceutical industry and advertising has been a major engine of medicalization over the last several, many decades. Um, oh wait, do I have this next slide in still? Go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, this is just another fun thing to highlight, and then I'm gonna like get off, and I'm gonna like move on to the, the subject at hand. I promise. Um, I haven't even updated these tables in like 10 years almost. Like these are just like one little snippet in time of like fines and settlements against drug companies. And I just remember around 2009 when we started seeing fines and settlements topping the billion, like a billion dollars. Um, so like this one here for Gia in 2009, 2.3 billion. I remember that. And then there was a few more, go to the next slide, that came out right at the same time, topping a billion dollars, mostly for illegal promotion and off-legal promotion and, um, you know, some for like hiding negative data and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it was like huge. And we're like, at that time I was like, they're going down, this isn't going to be tolerated, $2 billion fine. And it's like, no. It continues, business as usual continues. They budget for these kinds of things. Um, so um, the historical context being increasing expansion of medical jurisdiction over more behaviors, problems, conditions of life, largely but not exclusively fueled by pharmaceutical company um, marketing and interests and profit. Um, and then increasing regulation of drugs versus kind of a free-for-all. We're sort of starting to more regulation, more prohibition of some drugs with tighter controls on other drugs and gatekeeping authority finally established in 1951. They're like, you know what, y'all shouldn't just, you shouldn't have access to this. You really need to like have an intermediary here. So, okay, that's kind of a little bit of a touch of a historical context to bring us to our essential question, which is, I hope, oh yeah, so why does a doctor stand between us and the drugs we want to use? Okay, um, what is the need for gatekeeping uh, from a prescriber? Um, I suggest, and this is largely from that talk from my mentor that I was mentioning, that there are some assumptions, some really basic assumptions that kind of justify prescription privileges. And so, one, Drugs are inherently dangerous, um, and lay people cannot be trusted to use them properly. Um, lay people cannot or do not possess the knowledge on risk and benefits, so we need intermediaries uh, to gatekeep access as a way to protect the public uh, from these like dangerous drugs. And then here, this last one, psychiatric prescribers, um, for sort of the context we're talking about, but 
doctors generally, possess a unique knowledge about psychotropic drugs. That is, they have like this in-depth, specialized training, this knowledge base that no one could be expected to know unless you go through this specialized training. Um, and they apply that specialized body of knowledge to individual patient care. So these are the assumptions that like, okay, check, 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 makes sense. Okay, I'm just gonna pause for one second. And um, I just maybe maybe to yourself, maybe if you just look at this list of assumptions, um, if this makes sense to you, it's like, yeah, I know those are kind of the assumptions underlying this sort of social arrangement that we've all accepted. Um, if we were gonna challenge any of these assumptions, do you feel like they are challengeable? Any of them, all of them? Um, and like, what does your experience or knowledge or training or whatever you come to the table with, like? what kind of challenges might you pose um, to any of these assumptions? And I'm, I'm just gonna actually let you just, just talk with each other for just a minute. And do these feel like any of these are challengeable based off of your experience and knowledge? I'm just gonna give a minute to talk to, to your neighbors about that before I give you my answers. question of like what what sort of knowledge do we value as a specialized body of knowledge that we might want to um, uh, consult someone for uh, around a drug experience um, there was another piece of that too but but it slipped my mind so I'll we'll thank you for that <laughs> so I was thinking of the example of the uh, heart drug uh, Johnson and Decades ago, doctors would simply use the plant foxglove, mm -hmm. which worked quite effectively, but because they couldn't control the dosage, it resulted in numbers of deaths because it is uh, incredibly toxic at high levels and can cause uh, you know, heart attacks. And so that's one instance where that, I, that speaks to, I think, the need for number one, some control on the uh, production of medication by Johnson in this case. And number two, somebody who has some kind of qualification 
for helping a person determine a dosage without putting their life at risk trying to take different amounts themselves and they just figured that out on their own. Yeah, 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 supporting, um, yeah, dosage and preventing, um, yeah, life-threatening harms and illness and death from even properly administered. Oh gosh, what is the rate? So adverse reactions from properly administered drugs, not because you overdosed, not because there was a mistake in the prescribing, but adverse uh, deaths, deaths from properly administered drugs. Uh, I mean, it's like one of the top causes of death. I can't remember, I want to say like number six or something like that, but it, and we're not, again, talking overdose. We're talking about drugs that were prescribed correctly and used correctly as one of the top causes of death. Interesting. One more, what, does somebody over here have a, th here and then in the back and we'll, I'll move on. Horse dewormer. Horse dewormer? <laughs> Tell us more. People are taking it. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Uh, kind of on the first two points, uh, so like psychedelics and fusions, uh, the LD50 is like ridiculously high. And ridiculously high LD50 is with psychedelics and yes. And uh, psychonauts tend to be pretty informed. And, uh, psychonauts do tend to be a pretty informed group. Yes, so like both the first two points, like actually that like lethal dose of many of these substances is like really high. You have to try to reach it. And some of them we don't even know what it is because it's so high. Um, and um, yeah, there are communities of people without having gone through medical training that are quite informed on, on, on many of these substances. Um, yes, all good points. I would echo all of that. And um, yeah, so drugs are inherently dangerous. We also know that there's quite a bias in the research literature, certainly around drugs that have been prohibited in the era of prohibition, and that many studies were funded specifically for the purpose of showing harms of drugs. So with confounding methodologies, um, that are, are just really hard to tease out what are the actual harms which is, or versus um, what's sort of like confounded and what is feeding into an agenda to show harms of drugs. So we don't have great research and of course when drugs are scheduled they kind of cuts it off from medical research so for a lot of reasons we don't have a full accurate and unbiased evidence base to, that gives us a good picture of really of the harms of drugs. Um, and we also know that many of the harms of drugs um, are actually better associated with the harms of prohibition than the drugs themselves. So I think there's good challenges to that assumption. Um, I think the internet has showed us that lay people can be quite sophisticated and their knowledge and sharing resources and knowledge, sharing information on drugs, Arrowhead, what are some of the other slides? There's, also, there's good ones. Uh, same thing with psychiatric drugs. Um, I've done a lot of work on the patient forum, sharing information on antidepressant withdrawal when they couldn't get good information from their doctor on that. Um, and so, yes, I think just the internet alone gives us some sort of compelling examples of lay people who can compile really good, sophisticated knowledge on drugs and make informed decisions. Um, so why can't lay people be sufficiently informed? Like, why can't they, if that is an assumption that would sort of justify prescription privileges. Um, and it's not also true that, going to this last point, it's not necessarily true that prescribers apply a specialized knowledge to individualized patient care. I'm sorry to say it. If you're a friend of mine and who is a psychiatrist in the room, I love you. And <laughs> um, the fact is that any drug might be prescribed to any patient with any diagnosis, mental health diagnosis, and with a lot of trial and error. And that's true for psychiatric prescribing. That's just what it looks like. So not to disparage or devalue medical school and the specialized training and knowledge base that is developed in medical school, because that is real. But for psychiatric prescribing, I think the waters are a little bit more muddy in terms of what the specialized knowledge is that could only be applied in a very individualized way. I don't know if that is really quite how it works. 
Also, uh, I think as we were talking about here a minute ago, in psychedelics, who holds specialized knowledge? We can talk about that. Yes. So, who holds a special thing, right? So, do we default just because that's sort of a social arrangement that exists that we're all accustomed to, and sort of say, yeah, well, you went to medical school, so you must hold specialized knowledge because it's a drug and we put it in our body, so it must be yours, right? <laughs> like, it must be your expertise. Well, I think that's a really good question that we should be asking ourselves. Like, who holds specialized knowledge? If we decide we do need a gatekeeper, who is the appropriate gatekeeper? So the fact that, um, the fact, I think we have a couple lessons that we can learn based off of psychiatric prescribing as we move into psychedelic advocacy and like what this world is going to look like. Um, and I believe that there's maybe some unintended consequences of the fact that we have concentrated authority for drug access to prescribers. There's unintended consequences of that and some lessons, hopefully, that we've gained on the next slide. And it's a lot of words, I apologize. I just wanted to, on the next slide, thanks. <laughs> um, you can't see my quote at the bottom. Um, okay, so it's a lot of words, but really, one, I mean, this like reality that drug companies shape prescribing practices. They do. Drug companies exert like enormous influence over prescribing practices, and doctors and the, pro the profession has been sort of slow to catch up to lived reality. So the disabling effects of early neuroleptic drugs, uh, withdrawal effects of antidepressants, um, all of these were reported by users for decades, for a long time, before, for before doctors, before the profession, before drug industry started um, uh, paying attention or validating them as like legitimate effects. So it was users who were complaining about sexual dysfunction of antidepressants years before drug companies picked it up and started asking about it in clinical trials as a, even an on the side effect checklist. And even then it was haphazard so that they could like minimize the apparent prevalence of sexual dysfunction uh, for antidepressants. So even just getting good information on like, what's the rate of sexual dysfunction? It took like three decades <laughs> to arrive at that because drug companies are so involved in like creating, asking the questions and funding the research and narrating everything. Um, I'm not going to go into more examples. There's more examples. Um, I also think that some of the unintended consequences here of concentrating authority, gatekeeping authority, um, is actually possibly a greater exposure to toxic effects and more risky, more risk taking than we might otherwise take if it wasn't given us to given to us by a doctor. So there's like this sort of responsibility as we give authority, we concentrate authority into this single group, um, then we sort of give over responsibility and we might be actually putting ourselves, like how many of us would be on a cocktail of like Zoloft and Abilify and Lamictal or put our, you know, or have a 12 year old on a combination of Zoloft, Abilify and Lamictal, if it was us, on us, like the responsibility was on us to do that, we probably wouldn't find ourselves in some of these cocktails that are definitely untested um, but because the doctor gives it to us, there's like this inherent sort of like trust and the authority and the expertise of that. And so we might find ourselves in more risky situations when we concentrate authority that way than more cautious if we sort of had that, had that authority and responsibility for ourselves. Um, not that drugs can't be helpful, that's not, you know, that's not the question. Drugs can be helpful, not helpful, whatever. Uh, but does it contribute to better outcomes for patients? This sort of social arrangement. If you haven't read Whitaker's book, it's older, it's 2010. But it's still required reading in my course at CSU, even though it's 10 years old, because it's just good. So this question of like, has this arrangement led to better outcomes? Has this paradigm of drug treatment led to better outcomes for patients? This is a really good one. Um, OK, so finally. Um, this last one, just we'll read that one. Um, the other unintended consequence is like we're kind of the subject of like, what do drug companies want to tell us versus what do, what's really relevant for us to know as people, as patients, as people who use drugs. What might be more relevant is to compare, you know, well, we just had a study, macro psilocybin with an SSRI, like that was like one of the first comparisons ever, <laughs> like direct head to head, and that should have 
not taken so long to get there. Um, but like real, uh, like what really are my options and how do they compare? How would opium compare with housing and psychotherapy? Like those like mm -hmm. questions relevant to our lives versus the questions that drug companies want to tell us about. So that's another unintended consequence of concentrating that authority. Okay. So finally, this brings us to the rights-based approach. Uh, go on. Yes. Okay. So basically, what we're saying, so to contrast this with a rights-based approach, some people suggest, some people will suggest that our right to mind-altering drugs is more fundamental and universal, that we have an inherent right to explore our consciousness, uh, there doesn't have to be a higher spiritual purpose, a higher moral purpose, a higher therapeutic purpose uh, for us to explore our own minds, um, other than the fact that I want to, and I'm not harming anybody else. Um, so this is argued, you know, freedom of thought, um, you know, I have a right to my worldview, my beliefs, my opinions, and to direct my consciousness in the ways that I choose. That would be both the content and the process of my own mind. Um, so by restricting accessibility to psychoactive substances, prohibition limits what we can know about our own minds and how we can come to know it. So it's a more fundamental right in that respect uh, that I personally resonate with. And from this perspective, one could argue, somebody out in the world might argue this, uh, that no profession should have a state-enforced monopoly to grant or deny people access to the drugs they want to use. And so this is prescription privileges. It's a state-provided, state-enforced monopoly on the right to grant or deny people access to a substance. So presumably if MDMA makes it through FDA testing and mushrooms make it, makes it through FDA testing under our current sort of system of prohibition that's slowly opening up, prescribers will control and gatekeep access to them. That will be the arrangement, just like they do with stimulants and benzos and antidepressants and all the other drugs. So fully committing to a rights-based approach, if we were really gonna like, like put our line in the sand and say rights-based approach, cognitive liberty, then we might also have to question the role of the prescriber in this little arrangement. Um, as a gatekeeper, and also I think the rights-based approach sort of opposes this monopoly of organized medicine, trying to sort of like break it up. Um, um, go ahead. Yeah, that's good. Um, so a right to drugs is a right to heal, and a rights-based approach argues that prescribers, again, shouldn't have a state-provided advantage over other forms of healing. Thank you. One snap. I appreciate it. So, <laughs> rights based approach. So, a state provided advantage over other forms of healing. So, a right to drugs is a right to heal. Um, and this is not to disregard the important role of doctors in our lives. I'm so glad we have doctors. Thank you, my friend Alex in the back who went to medical school. I hope you're not mad at me. <laughs> um, Yes, obviously, like doctors are great and they do have specialized knowledge and we should use them and they have a certain role, but what is the appropriate role? And I think that's the conversation we should be having. Is it to gatekeep and grant, deny access and have the state provided monopoly and da 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 da? Or maybe it's more like a consultant or maybe it's a coach or maybe it looks like some other way. Um, next slide. So I'm going to bring this full circle and just say, I'm going to, I don't know if this is a high note or not, but there is such a thing as demedicalization. So we medicalize, 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 medicalize. We can also demedicalize and, you know, the, um, uh, we like remove it from sort of the medical jurisdiction. Uh, it's no longer defined in medical terms and no, no longer requires medical expertise. Um, and of course, the classic example of demedicalization is the vote by the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from the list of mental disorders by vote, which is of course how you create new diseases as you vote on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but demedicalization only succeeds if there's like strong, like there's resist, like you've got to challenge the medical framework, you've got to create alternative frameworks that are reasonable, that are practical, uh, that we have to mobilize support for it. And so I think that's what we need to do as a community moving forward 
with the opportunity we have with statewide ballot initiatives and things changing like what do we want um, and if we if we were an era of prohibition what are we going to supplant that with I feel like if we supplant it with the medical model then that means we're going to concentrate authority to prescribers as gatekeepers um, and these medicines very often have a very long history of safe use. And so indigenous practices, the community practitioners who are carrying these lineages and like doing this work already and have been for years could be just entirely engulfed by Western biomedicine scriptures. Um, and so I think we just need to be very thoughtful um, about what we want to do, not be rushing into just like the first good opportunity that's presented to us when a big money person comes into the state and says they want to you know, put something on the ballot, which happens, by the way. I think we need to, um, yeah, be in dialogue, know what we stand for, know where we want to go, and mobilize a, as a community. And, and, and maybe this rights-based approach, you know, sounds appealing to you, to our community. Oh, and I want to end with this, just real quick. Sorry, one last thing, the Beckley Foundation. I wish we were talking about this more. Next slide, please. Uh, just as an example, and this is like the last, last, last thing. Are, are y'all familiar with the Beckley Foundation report on regulate the roadmap to regulating MDMA? Um, because I think it's really interesting. And the first is rescheduled uh, so that we can, you know, remove the hurdles for medical research. It's rescheduled, uh, decriminalize. So decrimin decriminalization is the backbone of it. Let's remove criminality from the equation. It opens up access to drug testing and all the things that are prohibited by the RAVE Act. And then license pharmacy sales with patient education. So this is not by prescription. This is not a prescription-based plant roadmap to regulating MDMA. This is decrim first, rescheduled, decrim first, and then users, you can go to a pharmacy, you certify that you receive patient education on how to use MDMA safely, and then you can buy it. Um, and then, of course, with all the user controls, childproof packaging, and over 18, and public messaging, so to create cultures of use around it, adult-friendly, wait, no, MDMA-friendly adult lounges <laughs> <laughs> for, like, social use, maybe you don't sell alcohol, like, little harm reduction measures, whatever. This is a really, there's a full report. It's, like, very, very long. It's very interesting. I really like it, and I would love to see something like this more at the forefront of like what we're talking about in like Colorado for like what we might want to move toward. Um, I think medicalization is like the easy sort of no-brainer like oh yeah that'll make everybody feel safe go to your doctor um, but I think we could do better. Thank you. <laughs> like one or two questions or comments and then we always have time to mingle and talk afterwards so yes please can you talk about the fact that like like mushrooms are going through or sorry uh, marijuana going through the medical and now recreational and how that model works for i don't know yeah so the question is like you know how like cannabis went like medical and then recreational legal and so yeah there are a lot of people in the industry I, I, I was never in that industry and, and I, I don't know I welcome like other perspectives on this but yeah a lot of people think that that was the way to go and it is the way to go like okay medicalization like it makes sense people can buy into it the public who isn't radical and free thinking <laughs> whatever they'll, you know, they'll feel safe and it's just we all know it's a farce yeah of course um, but it's a stepping stone towards recreational or like legal use. Um, so yeah, I think there's some arguments that could be made for it against that as a strategy. I tend to be very stubborn in values and not wanting to compromise, like, no, but this is the right way to go, or like, this is like the, <laughs> um, but I think as a strategy, some people would be like, no, and it worked. So. I don't know, does anybody else have an opinion on that who's maybe more plugged into the cannabis industry and how all that played out? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think medicalization has helped to protect me in some ways. Yeah. I use my doctor as a shield against the cop. 
I use your doctor as a shield against the cop. Yeah, so it protected you. So, I'm repeating kind of for yeah. everybody. So in 1997, I got my first prescription for marijuana in the state of California. I then got a prescription in Portland, Oregon. I then got a prescription in Atlanta, Georgia, though you couldn't buy a thing there. I still had a prescription, and I yeah. use it to show my senator and my congressperson that this is how I vote, and this is how I protect myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've used it as a shield mm -hmm. in some sense. Yeah, using it as a shield. I mean, I think there are some yeah practical benefits and maybe some strategic uh, benefits to it. I just get real. I, I personally, I guess I um, maybe it's just like my rebellious, non-authoritarian. I'm just I don't like having to play that ridiculous game. I completely agree with you, and I don't know why the doctor that I go to for my benzos can't sign a prescription for me for marijuana. Right. I go to a specialized doctor to sign a prescription for me for marijuana. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, there's pros and cons to all these. It's not like that clear cut. There's certainly advantages and disadvantages. I guess, you know, my advocacy takes me to just wondering if there's something more creative or innovative. If, if we do have an opportunity as a community, do we want to just kind of, you know, play that what we know out? Or do we want to put something a little more forward thinking out there? And what could that look like? Yeah. Please, in the back. It's not a prescription for marijuana. It's a permission slip. Ah. So you can write a permission slip so someone gets a discount on their pot before it's the only way you can get it. Yes. It was definitely a backdoor way yes. to get pot legally. Yes. And so it's not like we know what the dosage is and we should do this. It's like you have a permission slip to use pot however you think it works for you. Then I'm fine with that because it's safe. Right? And so. Why know, do you need a permission slip? Right. Why do you need, right. Why do you need a permission slip? Yeah. Well, because of politics. So you probably don't need a permission slip for psychedelics either, right? I mean, that's a question. Do we, who should give us that permission slip if we do because need one? Like, because you don't know what it is. If the pharmaceutical company is not making it, and you don't know what, I mean, now the marijuana industry will tell you the dosage of your edible or whatever. Mm -hmm. But for flour, you don't know what it is or how strong it is. There's no way to know your reaction to it. There's no studies about what happens. It was, and it's, the, you know, same for psychedelics. You don't really know what you're getting. So I'm not going to prescribe something. It's like any herbal supplement. You yeah. Know? I don't know what's in that herbal supplement. It's not. It's not regulated. Thank you. Um, in the back on the side, and we'll probably call it. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to like addiction. Uh, it's like a pretty big topic. I feel like in the yeah. states that kind of didn't get. I mean, it's a big topic. Speak about addiction in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, so if we have access and we don't have to go to our doctor, so first of all, we have addiction, so in the era of prohibition, in the era of like, we have to go to our doctor for drugs, and that like addiction ex exists, and so opening up access to drugs, I don't know if that would increase or decrease addiction, I don't know how that would sort of shift the dynamics around it. Um, I, I don't think there's evidence to suggest that it would increase addictions if we had access to drugs. Um, it would probably make it safer in a lot of ways, right? You could like have all the harm reduction measures, you got better information, you have drug testing, you could have all those things. Um, you wouldn't be you know, seen as a criminal for using drugs. So, I mean, I think there are some arguments um, in favor of opening up access. Um, I also think it's important that we create cultures of use around substances and normalize um, altering our consciousness in different ways, and how do we, um, you know, just, I, you know, when I was studying abroad, I was a foreign exchange student at like 15, and I'm, you know, there was a culture around drinking wine. I was in Argentina, I was an exchange student. There's a culture around drinking wine at dinner with your kiddos, <laughs> and, um, and so I think like creating cultures of use around substances that, you know, good information, drug testing, having communities that you know aren't stigmatized, that we can gather in public places and, and talk about it and commune around it. And I, I think that's part of it also. We're not gonna like solve addictions. Like addiction is pain and people are in pain. Um, that's gonna 
I mean, so how do we support that? Um, but it's certainly not by prohibiting substances. That's not worked. Um, so yes, that's a really big question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last last comment or question here? Yeah, well, first of all, the Dominican Home Exercise, because this is really cool, because, you know, we, we were going to the Dominican Home Exercise, and I used to do Laurie Corporal for Cannabis, and the, the, the fact of the matter is that these Could you repeat what she's saying for us? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can you repeat what she's saying? Yeah. 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 I want to thank the Novak Society because this is such a cool thing to do to discuss law reform before we go for it. So we know what we want because the world is a really big place. This this is a global movement, we all know it. And uh, what we've seen with cannabis going back to that, um, I'm Clarissa by the way, so hi everyone. And thank you, thank you so much. I'm also an exchange student, so <laughs> clearly. <laughs> so yeah, um, with cannabis what we saw too is that in the beginning we had models where people could still grow at home. So if you didn't want to go to your doctor, and you want to cultivate your own mushrooms, or you want to you know, produce your own medicine, you could. But as we've seen this evolve globally, and big money, and, pro, you know, and, and all of that, not just money, because money's not necessarily a bad thing, but how it developed, we've seen that this is not the case anymore. Where people, especially abroad, where these models kind of keep delayed and are still coming, um, people, it's, it's a barrier of access to have to have that sign off. It's expensive. It's much cheaper to grow your marijuana in anyone's backyard than to buy it from work. And that's what's happening with cannabis in the world today. And I don't want it to happen to psychedelics because it saved my life. And I know it saved probably most of us in here. Uh, so I really commend you on the debate. I'm very grateful to be here, here today. And I really want us to just think also, like you said, about alternatives because we can't do that in Denver. We're a really cool town, we're progressive. And uh, I like your idea of maybe like, who knows, like cultivation clubs, like we have in Europe for weed, uh, for psilocybin as opposed to buying it at some pharmacy, you know? Um, so anyway, I'm really grateful. And um, uh, once again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I yeah, appreciate that perspective. And yeah, we're just talking, we're sharing ideas, I'm asking questions. Um, this is more to have with, as we form, you know, there's going to be work groups forming as if this that there's a statewide initiative there's a lot of like dynamics because there's money and then there's the community and there's these different players and interests and so to see it all come together I, I just feel like I would really love to see um, some like bottom-up community approaches to how we want to shape this um, over the next five seven years um, for ourselves. So, um, with that said, thank you all for listening, for coming, for engaging. We look forward to the next time. Um, October 7th is our next meetup here, and we're actually going to share. Uh, we've got a couple of folks who are willing to share their stories um, who have terminal illness and have used mushrooms as part of their care and healing. Um, and uh, they're willing to come up here and share their stories. So, that's what we're going to do next month. And we're going to invite Denver City Council members. I don't know if they're going to come. <laughs> if you know anybody, if you have connections, of like these people need to be in the room, policymakers, whoever. Um, we are going to send out personal invites to at least Denver City Council because they should be reviewing at around that time a proposal to expand decrim uh, for the city of Denver. And so we would like to invite them into this. And um, yes, so look forward to that. Thank you all so much. Hang out, we can talk, chat, tip your servers well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.